Guys, I have a fun one for you. This one uh, <clears throat> was inspired, as were the last two, by uh, a devotional time on Wednesday morning when I, uh, I, I've been coming in to the work crew on a Wednesday mornings. We have an early morning uh, devotional. And the last two messages I've had have actually sort of been sponsored out of that. And uh, so the same thing is true uh, this week. However, there's a different twist on this one. I've been going back through some of the foundation stones of, we could say, of a fervor in your Christian life, because we have a tendency to have that fervor, have that passion dim, and what we need to do is learn how to cultivate, to blow upon the embers, and to see it uh, spike unto a roaring flame. We want to live in roaring flame mode and not in dying ember mode. And so uh, that's what this is about. This is about roaring flame mode. But I don't know if you guys like the picture to this one. It's rather heartwarming, I have to admit, uh, holding on to doggy. And uh, so for those of you that were there on Wednesday, you know precisely what the inspiration for this was. Uh, there is a little uh, dog, he's in the room right now as far as I know, and his name is Doggy, uh, and he belongs to Ronan Flood. If you look back to the back, there is Ronan with Doggy, and so it's pretty special to have Ronan and Doggy with us this morning, especially since uh, he, they, you know, they made the title. And uh, so <clears throat> if I could give a, a brief description of what inspired this, we were just having a time, because it was, it was Wednesday, Thursday was going to be Thanksgiving, so we were going around and just being grateful. And I think we started with Ronan and Erilyn, two, two little munchkins in our midst, and there was just a delight in the childlike beauty that they have brought, the warmth that they have brought to the work crew. And Ronan, meanwhile, had Doggy with him, and he was rolling around on the ground with Doggy, he rolled under a table with Doggy, he was, uh, he was just all over the place, and he was clinging to Doggy. And uh, I think the notation was, wouldn't it be nice if we lived our Christian life that way and we held on to the truth the way that Ronan holds on to doggy? In fact, at the very end, I was going to poke him in the stomach, you know, which is something I do to Ronan, uh, and I make a little noise, I go, uh, and then he runs and, and screams. And it's just a tradition we have. So I was moving in to do that, and he hit me with doggy. And so... You recognize when the enemy comes in, you know, that truth uh, has, can be quite the weapon. Uh, so there were all sorts of great illustrations for us, but it inspired this particular message, which I think you guys will enjoy, and yet it has a, uh, a powerful punch to it. A love-worn toy, the Christmas event 2012. So I don't know, uh, Nathan and Philip, I'm trying to remember if Philip was on our team yet in 2012. That's a long time ago. Uh, and Leslie would have been there, but every Christmas, it was my tradition to create some gifts for our staff, and, uh, but my gifts were always imaginative. They weren't actually practical, and so I would write up usually like a, it was like a 15 to 20 page, almost like book, and each chat, there were different chapters for the different uh, staff members. And 2012, it was love-worn toys. So I went around the Ludi home, and I collected different love-worn toys, things that had been loved so well that they had so much love vested in them that I could give them to our staff. Now, I didn't really give, for instance, Dan received Kip's uh, Baba and Blanky. Uh, and uh, he would, his Baba is his bottle, right? And he would... He didn't even drink out of a bottle anymore, and he just, he had chewed off the end of uh, the nipple part, and it, it, he just was comforted by this, so he couldn't go to sleep without his baba and blankie. And his blankie, to be honest, didn't smell that good, uh, but it was very precious uh, to him, and he clung to these, and you'd find them crammed into corners and everything. He'd be missing it, and we'd go dig and pull out his bed from the wall, and there it was. And uh, so there was all sorts of memories that were stirred up by that of just that unique thing. Of course, I likened uh, Dan to uh, Kipling's Baba and Blanky, uh, and it was quite a humorous uh, moment. In fact, I'm sort of giggling inside, but it would be an inside joke if I keep giggling, so I will continue. It's, uh, it was pretty funny. But love-worn friends, a heartwarming waltz through Ludi history. Now, I ran out of time to get full Ludi history, so I didn't get really Avi's dolls and Reese and Lily's special things, but I, did, I do have a start, at least. So 
uh, George the monkey. I don't know if even Hudson would remember uh, George the monkey, but there's Hudson with his binky and George, and he's laying on top of his other big monkey uh, too. But the one that most of us would remember as far as in the Ludi ham- family with, uh, with Hudson would be Rusty, uh, Rusty the doggy. And it's interesting, my first picture that I have in Ludi uh, photo history is with Harper stealing Rusty the doggy. And so can you believe that she actually has Hudson's Rusty right there? Uh, I've always loved that picture. <clears throat> so by the way, if you don't know, that's Hudson on the right uh, and Harper on the left. And then Lammy is another uh, historic, uh, you know, landmark of the Ludi home. And Lammy is a, <clears throat> a Lammy. And so here's uh, the Lammy Harper photo shoot. Uh, but Lammy was uh, very, very, and still is. I think Lammy still is very present tense in Harper's life somewhere, uh, right? You don't carry a Lammy around with you. But if I, if I went into your room, would I find Lammy in there? No, we wouldn't find Lammy. That is terrible. He's in the trunk. Okay. Well, we still, if we dug, we could find Lammy, right? So, but Lammy was uh, a very, very sacred thing in our life. And I still remember the time when we showed up at Disneyland and we found out that Harper had stowed away Lammy. And so the fear the whole day was that we would lose Lammy on a ride because Lammy had been lost. And I don't know if any of you remember the dramas, uh, the Ludi dramas of us then looking online to try and find a replacement Lammy because this wasn't going very well. And we ordered a Lammy that was supposedly looked like, but it came in and it was like a different Lammy. And we tried to con Harper with a new Lammy and it did not work. I just want you parents to know that a little kid can discern the difference between their Lammy and an imposter Lammy. So, and we did find Lammy under a chair at some point. I thought we'd exhausted every possible location, but uh, we did eventually find Lammy, which was very, very good. The days of furry friends that go wherever we go. Do you guys remember those days where you, would, you wouldn't want to go somewhere unless you could carry your furry friend with you? And it's weird because as you get to be an adult, you sort of forget about those days, and you forget, that, like my kids are asking me, did you ever have a doggy or a Lammy? And I'm sure I did. I just can't remember. It's like really strange. It's like seems so far distant. And yet, yes, I had little animals and things that I I, I carried around with me. Uh, But here's one of my favorite pictures. So there's Hudson with Rusty. And if if you look far to the right, you'll see Harper with Lammy down there. Do you see Lammy down there? It's like just trying to make it into the picture. So this is in Orlando, Florida on a walk, which we've taken many family pictures on that bench. Kip, remember that bench? Yeah, we have one of our favorite family pictures with Kip on that bench. I should have put that picture in. That would have been very good memories too. But uh, this is just, it brings back, it's heartwarming to me. It brings back so many memories. Rusty, Lammy, uh, Abby had baby doll, is that what it was called? Uh, baby doll. Uh, uh, and so we, there's been so many little special friends uh, in our midst. So introducing doggy, the um, doggy. And so this is Ronan uh, being caught. Uh, every time you look at Ronan, he has doggy, right? So here's some good pictures. I want you to think about your Christian life, okay, and how you hold on to the truth. Okay, look, he sleeps with the truth. He plays with the truth. Uh, there he is falling asleep again with the truth. Uh, and uh, look at that, it makes forts with the truth, uh, sits by the fire with the truth. Oh, isn't that precious? Those are great pictures. So Jess and James, that was, thanks for passing those along. <clears throat> so I'm going to liken this to the intimate cling of faith. There is something that God has given us. And I've, I've said this many times, but each of us has a physical hand. And that physical hand is designed to grip things. And it is interesting, but, you know, the idea of a grip is very, very important spiritually. And what we have spiritual, or what we have physically, we also have spiritually. So I have physical eyes, but I also have spiritual eyes. I have a physical nose, but I also have a spiritual nose. I have a physical mind, but I also have a spiritual mind. I have a physical heart, but I also have a spiritual heart. Well, think about this. I have a physical hand, but I also have a spiritual hand. And I liken that spiritual hand to faith. In other words, where we reach out and we grab a hold of God. Now, I have used that illustration many times because many of us have the grip, 
but we don't use it. It's almost like we pat the truth instead of hold on to the truth. And as a result, we lose track of that which we believe very quickly instead of clinging. There is something about the cling or the grip that is very, very important for our soul. And mechanically speaking in our spiritual life, when you begin to understand this, it actually really helps. So the intimate cling of faith, every child is seeking a place of refuge, comfort, and consolation. I, it's sort of hard to describe how a little baby works, but they're in this first mode of things. And when you look at a baby, you actually can see a new spiritual life as well. And there's a lot of parallels where we are new, newly born into the kingdom of heaven, and there's a tremendous dependency, but there's also initial native instincts within a child. Uh, I've always joked that a child never needs to be trained how to say the word no or mine. For whatever reason, the first thing they do when they pop out of the womb is seek out those words. And they will find them even if you never teach them to them. And there are certain qualities of a newborn which are cute is all get out and then there's some dangerous ones too that if not corrected if you leave you know live that way 20 years you're in trouble however praise god that babies are cute right and so but every child is seeking a place of refuge comfort and consolation isn't that interesting because a child will cling to things when they're when they're young because they they're looking for comfort they're looking for a warmth they're looking for a protection and a refuge now, that is ultimately meant to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, but it's a native instinct that we have. So I could have gone three different ways with this message. And the first one is what I already described, the truth. That the way Ronan plays with doggy is very similar to the way we want to hold on to the truth. That everywhere we go, that we're clinging always. And the truth is always with us. We are meditating on it day and night. That would have been a great illustration for today, but you can still have it. I've still given it to you, right? The second one is what I call wrestling prayer. The idea of prayer scripturally is one of hanging on and not letting go. And so the, the mental picture that I've given many times at Ellerslie is a long rope with a grappling hook attached to it. And God's promises are up into, in the heavenly realms, and we are believers. And so we swing that rope and toss it up into the heavenly realms and latch a hold of one of his promises. And then what do we do? We pull, and we pull, and we pull, and we pull. You see, that grip on the rope that we hold on to and we don't let go is part of how prayer works. You don't just pull once. Many Christians pray once for something. They're like, oh, God obviously didn't want to do it. However, we are designed to pull and to pull and to pull until that which is heavenly, that which God has promised, that which God desires to be done in this earth, comes from the heavenly realms to this realm. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the sample prayer. This is how prayer works. However, I'm not going that direction with this message. I'm just hinting that I could have, right? Those are both illustrations of the cling. Now I'm going to give mysterious option number three as what I talk about today instead of those two. I know some of you are disappointed that I'm not digging deeper into the truth or the wrestling prayer. But I think this one has great benefit to us. Mysterious option number three. So mysterious option number three is when we cling too long to a good thing. Isn't it an interesting thought to think that we can have good things in our life that we actually cling to for too long? They're, they're there for a season, but they're not meant to continue for all time. And of course, this is depicted very, very well in childhood. Because, for instance, God gave me parents. And in having parents, I can find certain dependencies that are animated within my soul and in my life because of my parents, and they're good. For instance, I begin to have a confidence that I have provision, and my next meal will be uh, will be delivered to me, that I will have what I need. Well, where did I get that from? From the fact that my father is laboring to make sure that I'm always going to be supplied for. And I could easily begin to cling to that and find rest and refuge in that. But I, I'm going to give you a list of things. Okay, so good things. Parental focus. When you're young, your parents are very attentive to you. And you cry, and there they are. 
You know, and so as a result, the benefit of this is, is quite ex- amazing. We can become dependent upon it. Parental comfort, when you, you know, scrape your knee or, you know, get a boo-boo, well, guess what? There your parents are to pick you up and to kiss you and to comfort you. Binky comfort, I know some of you call them passies, right? But there's a certain comfort. Uh, Kip used to, or not Kip, Hudson had a, a binky jar, uh, and he would store his binkies uh, in that, and uh, we had them all by his, uh, his crib, and uh, it, was, it was pretty cute. He'd have his, his collection, and he'd reach in and grab a whole bunch of them for the night, right? But then there were times when we were like, where's Hudson? And we'd look around for him, and we'd go up to his room, and there he'd be in a chair by his bed uh, with his binky jar and all of his binkies. And he'd rub one on his cheek, and he'd have another one in his mouth. Absolutely precious, right? However, if he's doing that at the age of 30, something's wrong, right? There is something, this is good, right? It's a comfort, but it's an initial phase comfort where a child is learning how to find that comfort in God. Blanky comfort. I don't know how many of you know what that's like, but there's that warmth and that, that coziness and that comfort, that security. That's why it's called a security blanket. Isn't that a weird thought? What is that blanket going to do for you? How is that going to really protect you? And yet it gives a sense to a young child of security. Nursing comfort or baba comfort for, for Kipling. Baba, remember that baba, uh, bud? Uh, furry friend comfort, which is what we're talking about today, like Doggy, like Lammy, like Rusty, like George. Those are furry friends. And then appetite comfort. Uh, there's a, there's a, I mean, this could have also been Baba or nursing comfort, but just appetite comfort. Whenever you're hungry, you have food. And when you get used to that growing up, it creates a certain dependency. It's good. You know, there are certain kids in this room that didn't have some of these things. And they could probably tell you, yeah, it's not the easiest way to grow up when you do not have that security. In other words, God designed us to have a certain security. And then parental provision. Say, say I'm short on money. What could I always do? I could always go to my dad, and he could give me some money. I mean, that's just how it works, right? My dad is always there to help me. Now, sometimes he would put caveats or conditions on it, like I need to do some work for it. However, the point being, I had a provider that always was there and able to supply. I remember a big moment in my life was when I was, uh, I was, I was engaged to Leslie, and my dad wanted to take me out uh, to get some clothes for a shopping trip. It was a big moment for me. My dad had always bought all my clothes for me. And my dad was very, very cognizant of clothing. And, you know, he had, you know, his closet was full of like 15, 20 suits, you know, and they, they all looked the same to me, but, you know, they, they were different. And, but he was, as some would say, a clothes horse. And so his, his clothing were, was a big deal. And he would look at my clothes and he's like, we need to get you a suit. How about two or three suits? And I didn't like wearing suits and I didn't want to do that, but my dad would always take me out, and he would, in a sense, dress me, and he would make sure that I looked good, and so it was a big moment. I'm engaged, and my dad's like, hey, I'd like to take you out to get some clothes, and I had to admit he was right. My clothes weren't looking so well. I'd been on the mission field, and everything I did have was sort of worn down, and we, and I, I said, I, I, I'm happy to go out shopping, but I'm going to need to pay for it. And even as I'm saying, even if it's, as it's coming out of my mouth, I'm sort of trembling. It's like, I don't really have that much, but I'm going to have to pay. And my dad's like, are you sure? Yes. It was really hard because I knew that if I was going to be married, I couldn't just go to my dad and say, hey, could you buy me some more clothes? I needed to learn to stand on my own two feet. I needed to be a man. And there is this transition process that takes place that Something that was good needs to be let go of, but it's hard. It really is. And in all of our lives, we have things that I don't even want to say are evil or bad, but they do need to be let go of. And I could say that that transcends the Christian life. When you are going to follow Jesus, you need to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow. And if I could, you know, take a a, a camera and zoom in on what that means, that means that we need to let go of all of this list 
uh, that we gain from our securities in this life, that we need to give up our hopes and our dreams. We need to give up all our little furry friends. We need to give up that which is comfortable to us, that which has brought us security in the past, that which has supplied provision for us, that we need to say, God, I trust that you will take care of all these things. That if we are going to follow him, we need to release that grip on anything that is not him. And that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means it's taking up our grip. And our grip was designed by our king in heaven to grip one single thing, and that is him. So the cling of Jacob, it's interesting because Jacob, his name even basically means like grabber, like clinger, uh, it, which is really strange, but that's what the name means. It means heel grabber. It means supplanter or deceiver, but we don't need to focus on those two things either. It's, it's interesting because if you were to think about it, if you knew the Hebrew language, you'd never name your child Jacob, right? And yet some of our best friends are named Jacob. You see, Jacob is a great name. Even though its meaning might be a little suspect, it's because of what Jacob represents. Jacob represents one that, yes, he did grab the wrong thing, but at the right time in his life, he let go of the wrong thing and used that grip to grab the right thing. And so I don't want to spoil the name Jacob for you. I actually think it's a great name because of what he symbolizes. He symbolizes, get this, us. He symbolizes the believer. He symbolizes the one who esteems the right thing, but has been grabbing the wrong thing. And that when he sees the right thing, he lets go of the wrong thing and grips the right thing. So I'm going to call Jacob the, the grabber of furry friends. Uh, see, you have to know the story well to understand where I'm going with this one. But let's talk about his furry friend. The first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Uh huh. We got a furry friend, guys, uh, and his name is Esau, and he is the first. And this is what we have a tendency to grab a hold of too. This is our furry friend, and we grab a hold of Esau. That's why he's even given the name heel grabber. When he was born, he was grabbing a hold of the heel of Esau, and so that's where he got his name to start with. And yet, that's symbolic of his entire life growing up is he's going to be going after something that isn't necessarily evil. It's just, it's not the fullness of what he's supposed to find. You see, he esteems the right thing. He recognizes that all things are given to the firstborn. It's like, what? He gets the birthright? Wait, he gets my father's blessing? Well, well, what about me? He came out second. So he doesn't get those things, right? But he esteems them. He wants the fullness of this inheritance that God has given to his, his, his lineage coming through Abraham and beyond. And so what does he do? He's a sneaky character. He tricks uh, and is a deceiver in every sense of the word. And he is going to find Esau hungry in the field coming in from hunting. And he's going to have his red stew just waiting. And he's going to waft. I think he was even like this with the smell. Uh, you know, so the smell could waft into the field. And Esau's like, oh, I must have some of that red stew. However, what you're going to see is Esau, or I'm sorry, Jacob, though he is not doing that which is godly, he is after that which is godly. Isn't that interesting? And doesn't that sound like a good description of us at times that we desire the right thing, but we oftentimes will do it in the flesh or we will do it in our own human effort. And that's what we see with Jacob. And so even though Jacob is going to do it the wrong way, he is after the right things. And he is going to, in a sense, con his brother into giving up his birthright in exchange for a bowl of red stew. And Esau is the exact opposite. Esau has the birthright, but doesn't appreciate it, doesn't see any value in it. And so he is going to forsake that birthright. And then we have the blessing, if you remember, uh, Jacob dressing up like Esau, which is a really strange story if you were to investigate it a little more, that uh, Esau was so hairy that a goat uh, is what he felt like, obviously, because when Isaac reaches out, you know, he's, he can't see quite clearly, reaches out, he's like, huh? You feel like my son Esau. How hairy was this guy? Goat? You know, and so that's how hairy this, his furry friend was. And yet Jacob esteemed the right thing. He wanted the blessing. 
He wanted the blessing ultimately of Abraham, which had come down through Isaac, his father, and he wanted that. He craved it. That's a good thing. However, he's using deception in his own human machinations to make it happen. Not a good thing. And so what you see is that Jacob is using his grip, his human grip, and he's grabbing a hold of Esau, saying, he has what I need. He's trying to find comfort. He's trying to find a future and a hope out of the first. You see, all of us, if you've never heard me say this, are meant to be born again. We're meant to be born twice. You see, we have a birth that comes through our mother, and that's our first birth. And it's the natural man. I always put it over here on this side of the stage. And it's a first man condition. But a first man is under judgment and condemnation. It can't please God. And it does not have the strength and the power in its own capacity to please God. So what that first man must do is recognize that apart from God, he can do nothing. And he must turn, humble himself, repent, and believe in Jesus Christ. And when he does, he becomes twice born or born again. And this second life, this second man, has power to live differently. Why? Because this life is no longer natural man life. This is God life, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, enabled by the power of God. And this is the life that pleases God. And ironically, Jacob is a second born. He has the right stuff. He just needs to use his grip properly and grip God instead of Esau. Jacob's furry friend. The furry guy had the birthright. The furry guy had the blessing. The furry guy had uh, the fur. So we have things in our life, doggies, Georges, Rusties, Lammies, that we hold on to. And we find a certain comfort in them. And I'm not here to say that that's not very precious and cute at a certain developmental stage, but just like my dad providing clothes for me, some of you could go, that is very noble of your dad, and I really appreciate the fact that your dad did that. that what a great dad you had. And I'd, I'd say, amen, I agree. However, you all have to also admit that if I'm married and I'm looking to my dad to care for me and to supply for my marriage, something is no longer healthy. And that's precisely right. You see, God desires us to mature unto these higher levels of maturity. And to do that, we have to release furry friends. We have to let go of first things. You see, a good dad needs to learn that he needs to be let go of. That there are certain things, like I'm a protector of my daughter. Zzz put an S on the end of that, my daughters. I'm a protector, I'm a provider, and I like being that. I like my daughters needing daddy. But then another guy comes in, it's like, who's this guy? And my daughters fall in love with him? Well, it sounds like my daughters all fell in love with one guy. <laughs> Who is that guy? However, when that guy comes along, what is my job? I have to let go of something good. My daughters also have to let go of daddy in that regard, and they cling to another man. Ah, that's painful, but it's good. It's the right thing, but it doesn't mean that my relation with my daughters was bad. It just means there's a time to relinquish what I'm calling in this message the furry friends, the things that are good but need to be relinquished for the next phase of life or the next stage of development. The dark night of the soul when you realize you need something more than your furry friend. Every single one of us, by the Spirit of God, is being brought to this place. Now, the dark night of the soul, for those of you that know the, the statement historically, because in the Bible it doesn't call it the dark night of the soul, that, I think, comes from St. John of the Cross, from you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's sort of a historic Christian statement that when Jacob realizes that in and of himself he doesn't have what he needs, that, that he cannot find it in himself, he recognizes that he needs to use this grip to grab a hold of God instead. And you remember the night where he wrestles with the angel of God, which is actually God? That's what he's doing. He's going to use this grip properly, the way he was designed, and his life is going to now receive a blessing from that point forward. And if, if you remember the story, 
Jacob and his, his 12 uh, sons and his, uh, all of his wives, sort of a complex uh, family dynamic there, are sort of fleeing from Laban's control, and they're trying to go to the land of promise. They're headed in the right direction. Again, Jacob's doing the right thing, just the wrong way. And he's trying to do this in his own strength. But God genuinely is drawing him towards the land of promise, just like he is us. But you know what stands in the way? A very angry Esau. Do you blame him? This scoundrel named Jacob conned him out of his birthright and his blessing. And now he is promised to kill Jacob. And he stands right in the way. Well, I'm going to liken that to your first man, your flesh, that dimension of you that is dead set against you pursuing Jesus, against you letting go of anything good or any of those first things in your life. And it stands blocking the way, and Jacob comes to his end and realizes he can't overcome that. He does not have the capacity and the power to overcome the flesh in his life. And so he splits up his camp into two parties, lest one, you know, get attacked, the other one could slip away. And he goes by himself in the dark of the night and encounters God. And he wrestles with him through the night. Let's read that story. Genesis 32, 24 through 32. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Isn't that an interesting thing to acknowledge? I'm a heel grabber. That's what he asked. I'm a a supplanter. I'm a deceiver. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Now, what's the difference between the name Jacob and Israel? Jacob, in a sense, means means clinging to the wrong thing, if you want to say it that way. Whereas Israel would be like clinging to God. It's one who has grabbed a hold of God as opposed to grabbed a hold of the things of this earth and tried to find satisfaction with them. You see, God gave us a grip, but the key with that grip is we need to let go of all this earthly stuff that is taking up and hogging up this territory known as your grip your faith, your focus, your confidence. You need to let go of that and grab a hold of God. And when you do that, you will find breakthrough. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Holding on to furry friends. So I don't know if you can identify maybe some of the furry friends in your life. It's a very delightful, cute name for some of the things we hold on to. But there are certain things, have you ever noticed when, and I've had many people say this to me, it's like when, I, when I'm approaching their soul to talk about Christ with them, it's like, hey, don't ask me to give up such and such. Have you ever heard that? It's like, don't ask me to give up my, hur, 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 you fill in the blank. And it's interesting because I would say if you're that sensitive to giving something up, you might as well circle it right now. That's obviously something in your life God needs to deal with. A lot of times God has to deal with us where we don't obviously see it. But if you're that obviously seeing it that you are defensive, saying, God, don't ever ask for this, let God investigate that a little. Because these things, if there's anything you are hesitant to give up, that's showing something to your soul. Because technically, just like the Beatitudes say, we should be poor in spirit, which is another way of saying we should have relinquished everything. Nothing should hold us. We should have have the freedom to give this grip wherever God would let us give it, wherever God would lead us to give it. So holding on to furry friends. When you're young, it's innocent and cute. 
It is, we have to admit, that's pretty precious, right? However, as you get older, it becomes distracting and unwise. And then as you get older than that, it becomes disturbing and dangerous. And then if you continue and you do not let go, it becomes deadly and disastrous. These things are addictions. These things are things that have a hold on our life that we refuse to let go of. They become identity points for us. And as a result, when we are defined by our furry friends, instead of having them hold a place of comfort in our life when we're young and we're learning to place that need for comfort in its rightful spot, which is God Almighty, well, then these things can supplant the working of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so as a result, for any of us, whatever it is, if you have something in your life that God I want to serve you, but please do not touch this. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. If you're going to follow Jesus, you need to deny yourself, which in a sense in this message means let go. You need to pick up your cross. Whoa, what, what does it mean when you pick up your cross? Well, you have to give up your grip on everything else. It's sort of hard to carry your cross when you're carrying all sorts of other stuff too. You need to pick up your cross and follow him. Well, you do know what a cross leads to, right? There's no one that picks up their cross that doesn't end up dying on that cross. In other words, you are picking up a cross and it will lead to the extermination of your first life, of all that that entails, so that you can live fully for Jesus forever and always. So the dark night of the soul, when you finally let go of your furry friend and grab a hold of God instead. So this is a point that God will bring us to. And if you've ever been in a place where you realize, God, I can't do this. I can't pull this off. It's a desperation place where you've tried and you've tried and you've tried to overcome whether it's an addiction, whether it's some impulse that you have, whether it's some uh, cyclical pattern and behavior that just always seems to mess with your life. And you're like, God, I don't know how to get past this. See, he's bringing you to the dark night of the soul. What, do you, what does he want you to acknowledge? He wants you to acknowledge that you can't do it. It's okay. However, that's not the end conclusion. What he wants you to acknowledge is that he can do it. See the difference? I can't do it prepares you to recognize he can do it. I can't do it frees you to release all of your efforts, all of your own attempts to say, these don't work. This works. When you hold on to God and let him be your savior, when you let him be the conqueror, when you let him be the champion, when you let him do the work, faithful is he who has called you who also will do it. Your God will do it. But until you come to the end of yourself, your dark night, where all of your efforts to gain righteousness, all of your effort to gain Esau's birthright, Esau's blessing, and you're still not finding what you're after, that's because it's not found in your furry friend. It's found in Jesus Christ. And so that process of reaching the dark night of the soul is not something that any of us is that excited about, but it's truly a gift of the Holy Spirit. And so if any of you find yourself in that place, praise God. I've said that to a lot of people in the dark night of the soul, and they sort of look at me like, uh, you seem happy right now, Eric. I am. Why wouldn't I be? You're at that place of breakthrough. I don't feel like I'm at a place of breakthrough. Well, do you have any confidence in yourself? No. Perfect. But do you know who can save you? I know Jesus can. That's my only hope. I go, hmm. You see, this is good stuff right here. This is the makings of breakthrough. When you come to the end of yourself and you recognize that there is nothing in yet furry friend side of your life that can truly help you live the life that you've been called to live, then you are ready to let go of that counterfeit and grab a hold of the real thing. So listen to this. The dark night of the soul, it's a tiresome wrestling match that is in your best interest. When God brings us to this place, and we have students here at Ellerslie, it is not uncommon for a student to walk through this exact process in the first week, maybe 10 days. 
And I'm not saying that that's some formula. I'm just saying that's very common. Because they're coming into an environment that is so focused on Christ. And it exposes different things that they've been clinging to. And yet, there's a wrestling match in letting go of those things, those dreams, those ambitions, those desires. Like, God, but I want you, but I, can I keep this at the same time? They want the fullness of Christ, but they recognize they can't seem to get through the door as long as they're holding on to this. They can't seem to grab their cross and pick it up when they're holding on to this in their hand. So they need to let go of something to grab a hold of God, the way that God designed their spiritual grip to work. Genesis 32, 31. It's a strange statement in Scripture, but very profound in understanding our spiritual life. Just as he, speaking of Jacob, crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. So one of the most profound pictures in this is what I call wrestling until the breaking of day. That God wants us to hold on, whether it's in prayer. If I was teaching on wrestling prayer, I would use the same Scripture. In other words, that God is... He wants us to hold on to his promises, his nature, his character, and say, Eric, don't let go of me. Do you trust that I have it? Yes. Do you, try, do you think you can get it anywhere else? Can anyone else answer this dilemma for you? No. Then hold on. And so you wrestle and you wrestle and wrestle until the sun breaks, until your night turns into morning, until you can see the light and there's that breakthrough in your life. And what you see is there's two things happening here. You see a breakthrough. You know what's just up ahead in this morning light for Jacob? Is Esau is going to part his army and let him through. That which has always stood in his way is going to make way for him to go to the promised land. And the same is true in your life. That flesh that has always sort of held you down suddenly has no ability to stop you. And now the work of grace can move forward into the land of promise. But there's something else in this story. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun rose on him. We have the light. We have the breakthrough. And he limped on his hip. Well, that's not very cool. And yet there's something about this. Jacob had always rested his confidences in his ingenuity, in his brilliance. The guy is a sharp character. And if you study his workings with those... uh, those horses, you know, under Laban. Yeah, you know what? This guy knew what he was doing. He was playing Laban. Boy, he was getting it good too. And, uh, but he was leaning on his own strength to con for the birthright, to con for the blessing, to con Laban for his horses. Smart guy. But he needed a limp to really have a breakthrough. And the same is true with us, that God needs to touch us in certain aspects of our life to allow us to see weakness and feel weakness in our life. If you're confident in what you can bring to the table for God, you're not really going to be usable by God. Remember Moses? Moses was fairly confident that he was groomed well in the courts of Pharaoh. Well-educated, he was a military man, he had it all, and then he suddenly realized that he was Hebrew. You know what? God's grooming me to be a savior for this people. And so he takes it into his own hands, kills an Egyptian, buries him in the sand. He's like, I'll do this. And God's like, you know what, I'd like to use you, but not yet. Forty years later, after Moses comes to the end of himself and has a limp and actually doesn't think he can do anything, he's like, God, I don't know why you want to use me. And God's like, now I can use you. You see, until God gives you that limp, that sense of weakness, that clear sense that you in and of yourself are not the solution, That you in and of yourself, with your talents, your abilities, your power, cannot save the world. Until you come to the end of you, and you let go of yourself as a furry friend, your talents, your dreams, your desires to impact the world, you say, God, I give it all up. You see, this has to be you that does it. When you get that limp, the sun breaks. The two are synonymous with each other. That when that weakness is cultivated in your life, that limp, at the same time, there is a victory and a new name. No longer are you the one that are using your grip like Jacob to grab a hold of the things of this earth, but you are now using your grip like Israel to grab a hold of God. And as a result, the promised land is right up ahead. 
holding on to the ultimate furry friend. So I figured this would be a great finishing touch, a great mental picture for us, because here I'm telling you to give up furry friends, but those are lowercase f furry friends. But there is a furry friend that is the ultimate one to hold on to. I thought this was a great picture for it. So that's, there's Aslan with Lucy. And even though we know it's just a story, the story is depicting Aslan as a Christ, right? And a Christ picture. And so just to think about letting go of everything else and grabbing a hold of the lion's mane and carrying that lion with you, or maybe he carries you with him wherever he goes. That's probably a better way of saying it. But going from doggy to Aslan, going from furry friend to Christ. For each of us, in our own situations, there can be blockages. There can be things that are hindering our forward progress. Frustration points. Cyclical patterns of defeat where it's like, oh, I'm starting to overcome this. Oh, there I go again. And it can be so frustrating to the soul. However, I want you to allow the Spirit of God to examine your grip this morning, your spiritual grip of where your confidence lies. Does it lie in your ability to live a perfect, pure, righteous life? Because if it does, God needs to touch that. It's never been up to your ability. It is up to his ability. Your faith needs to rest squarely on his ability. Who's the one that saves? You or God? Now hold on, because there's a little bit of a wrestling match, and God's going to try and shrug you off to see if it's genuine faith. No, God, I, I have nowhere else to go but you. I can't break this habit without you. I can't overcome this without you. You are my only hope. You are my salvation. Now we're getting somewhere. You see, when you come to the end of yourself and allow God to touch that socket in your hip so that you can be weakened instead of the all-sufficient one for yourself, and you can grab a hold of God and let him be your sufficiency, you have found the essence of salvation. And it isn't something you just find once in your life when you come up to some uh, you know, front of a church and pray a prayer. It's something you walk in. It's something you live out. You can't do this, but he can. And he will when you grab a hold of him and put your trust in Jesus Christ. Father, this is a work of grace for you to convince us in the depths of our being of our need for you is a work that only you can do. But Lord, we ask that you would convince all of us, that you would bring us to that fresh place of weakness, to recognize that in and of ourselves we can't, but you can. Lord, we put our hope, our faith, our confidence in the living God afresh today. Take this grip. Lord, if there are any lowercase f furry friends in our life that are filling up our grip, I pray that you would bring us to that place of fresh relinquishment and that we would expend that faith of our soul in the right direction to grip and hold on to the living God. It's in the precious name we ask this. Amen.